We definitely go with that. Yes. <laughs> All right, well, the, the thing that I always do wrong is uh, running over time and maybe leaving that thing for questions. So let's get going, and I'll do my best. Um, thank you, Hakeem and uh, Elaine, for setting this up, because I'm really excited about when normally when I'm doing stuff here, I love what I'm doing, but in this, in this case, it was just an excuse to talk about stuff I'm genuinely hyperactive about. So, um, I'm not going to introduce myself much because I do that a little bit in here, and uh, let's just go. Uh, I'm EJ. Uh, my actual name is, is Eric Oxman, but my mom calls me that. Pretty much everyone else calls me EJ. Uh, so, is it, is it entirely computer science undergrad or mix? Computer science library. Okay, cool. All right, well, then. That will fit right in. Um, and everyone can hear okay, yeah? All right. So, I went to UC Berkeley from, uh, from uh, 88 until 92, and I did a combo of electrical engineering and computer science, specializing in robotics and control systems. Because um, I decided what I really wanted to do was build robots. And it turned out I was wrong. But um, I paid for university by. I'm terrible as a waiter, so I wrote video games. Right? And um, at the time, computer games, like this was state of the art. Right? This, was my, this was my second project, and it was the one that paid for my second year of, of undergrad. And uh, does anybody know the game? Yeah, it's really old. It's Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and I actually have this running here, uh, so you can see, I'm gonna see if I can magnify it a little bit so that you can see. So, uh, this, this was the most that a computer could do at the time. And you can get what's going on, right? There's no voice and all of this, but uh, he's soaking wet, and she's interested in their conversation, or just in her report, and then, um, and Ken, and you get what's going on. This was made for computers with not only no 3D hardware, no floating point. Right, this is mostly 15 bit addressing. This is very, very small simple machine. Um, and so games went through a transformation at this point. In a very small amount of time, they went from stuff like this in 1989, so stuff like this, right, 2008, that's really kind of a short time. I actually gave a talk at SIGGRAPH, the computer graphics conference, in 1994, and we showed real-time 3D accelerated hardware. We call it a GPU now, uh, but it was about the size of this table, half the size of this table. It was an Onyx by SGI, and it was a quarter of a million dollars, uh, not including the custom circuit you needed to plug in. And some of the feedback we got in 94 was, it's a cool demo, but it doesn't scale up. Like, are you going to sell those? It's not practical, because especially in people's houses. And uh, it's not clear what you're going to do with it. And now, your phone is probably more than the um, And video game technology did this really weird transformation that has all sorts of other applications. Some of them are serious, like medical imaging. Some of them are just food. So, We'll go on to those. Um, the first thing that, uh, that, that the, kind of one of the biggest awesome new tools for workshops for mechanical engineers or, or uh, kind of engineering in general is all this CNC tools. And they're not really new, but they've gotten really, really good. And so the barrier most people run into with using these tools for amazing stuff is that they would have to do custom software. This is you guys are, right? You, this, is, this is not a barrier. So for example, this is uh, used a laser cutter to strip out the not smart parts of the leaf without touching the stems. Um, it's for sure not useful, but it's kind of cool. And, uh, and, and then this is um, a 3D printed stainless steel padlock. Right, which the lock is, uh, they're much, much more secure if they're on fire. Um, and then, 
So then things that used to take a lot of time. So if that padlock, for example, was a shape on the inside, it was like a plane boot, you couldn't really machine to do it. You can take complex designs, use game renderers basically to look at them, test them, and then 3D print them as one moving part piece ready to go. Right? It's a little challenging because stuff you have to do when the axle's not fit. But this is just screwing around. Right? This building a machine like this would have taken more than a year if I had to iterate. So there were probably 115 iterations on the model before it actually worked. That would have taken a few years for sure. Um, and so in this case, the, the machine was entirely parametrically generated by software. Uh, also, my, my muse, my wife, Sue, is a, uh, she's a mechanical engineer, and she uh, looked at these, at these wonky things here, and she said, oh, honey, that's called a camshaft, and you're doing it so wrong. Uh, but uh, sorry, right. of course. Uh, and then this one I actually have here. This is an odd, it's a, using, again, the custom software but to drive a laser cutter, and it's a little machine that is all mechanical, there's no electricity, there's a little lever that you use on the back to run it, and it has a map and plot hands and a time and a date, and a latitude and longitude, and when you run it, the plot hands go through about an hour and a half, and in the center, you can see what the solar eclipse looks like at that time. This is a ridiculous amount of effort to make a machine for one event, but you can do it then. And you can, you can basically write code that outputs out an SVG file and run it through the laser cutter. And an art display, somebody who was looking at this dropped it and broke a bunch of the gears inside. And the machine is so repeatable, I recut new gears, the car put it back together, and in one day it was back on display. So these tools are available to everybody, but especially to you guys. Okay, I'm actually going to go far on the plan, but we'll see. Fun. This is a really fun project. So in the San Gabriel Mountains, just off of Caltech, up like the right there somewhere, there is an observatory called Mount Wilson. Mount Wilson Observatory has a bunch of instruments on it, and uh, it's this, this one is a 16-inch optical telescope. It's been there for 110 years or so. In fact, um, this is the mirror for it, the reflecting mirror being brought up in 1917. Um, there are other parts were brought up on donkeys. Um, and so this telescope has been there for a really long time. And they, the controls have been modernized in the 70s, I think. Um, and then Yale here is one of a very small team that's restoring these two telescopes, the 60 inch and the 100 inch, so that they can be used for astronomy again, mostly for outreach. So this telescope is where Einstein and Hubble did most of their famous work, right? The most of their astrophysics work. And uh, so now you can actually use it again. The telescope itself looks like this. It weighs the same as a 737. And it actually moves smoothly because it's buoyant on a giant bat of mercury. Which is, you wouldn't do that now, but it works really well. Um, so what they needed was something that would read the encoders. So for the restoration, they needed to build something that would read these, these old encoders, convert it to the right ascension declination, and figure out where the telescope is pointing so that the operator can see it on the little monitor up in front of them, except mostly it's all black because we can use the dark. And so, Ed yes, is the actual software, and it's effectively a game engine. Um, in fact, it's even more a game engine because uh, it's got to it's gotta go, I think we're going on uh, 10 hertz here for the refresh, but um, it needs to run for a really long time without crashing. In the original testing for this, the font draw code, this is a Linux machine uh, in, in the observatory, the font draw code crashed after about two weeks because if you look at modern font draw code, it uses, it does a lot of memory allocation, it uses a lot of library calls, and 
you really don't have control over it. In console games, we have this, we have the, you know, the same issue where the store owners would turn on the console in the window and just leave it going for a week. Um, so all of this has been basically replaced, the fun drive has been replaced with pretty much the same type of using that Indiana Jones game to physically draw the bitmaps just piece by piece. Not very modern, but this has been running continuously since 2009. Um, and it's, it's uh, designed to have it meet. Um, so we'll see. <laughs>
Um, but that's, we never experience those. We experience fire and fever and rash, and we have to be careful about chicken pox, right, and all this stuff. So, so uh, this, is, this was um, just a good way to kind of help him express. There's going to be these things being very difficult setbacks. And uh, so, so this, right, it's, it's, um, was a super fun project. And they put it on the website for And uh, Ben had to, he had a really bad relapse after he finished the project. And when they checked him into the hospital in Houston, they discovered that everyone there already knew him and had his game on all the computers so that they could to play it. Um, and then about, oh, yeah, right, well, we, we got to go into the archives in Lucasfilm. They, they, they liked the project and they gave us special permission to go and play with the props. Um, and so I learned a valuable lesson that I still carry with me, which is never give an eight-year-old over the bicycle. Um, <laughs> and then about a year later, Ben's mom called, and she had, uh, I, I thought, oh no, what have we done? And she said, there, we've been invited to lunch. Um, the Dalai Lama gave us two little shawls on us and thank us for doing the project. And it's, it's a video, right? It's, so we, we, we were kind of having crazy fun and expressing what Ben wanted to do. And it was just about the most fun project that I ever worked on. Right. And as with all the other projects I just showed you, they didn't make any money. Right. Um, but they were awesome and fun. Uh, and so, right, this is, is going to be the nerdy part. We'll get through it. And then there's more, there's more crazy part. Um, <coughs> okay. Alright, so uh, here's the thing. Nobody's interested in assembly language. Anyone here is interested in assembly language? That's great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so am I. And uh, it is rare. We have tons and tons of so many software developers, and most of them, when they're debugging and they get the end of the source code and see the wall of, of X, they go, oh, okay, that's it. I can go past that. Um, turns out we can, and we're about to. Um, so, the, uh, and you can do things that look like magic. Uh, and when you do things that look like magic, companies pay very well, and you can do things like work three days a week and do fun projects the rest of the time. So here's a, a function that I wrote to add two matrices together and then normalize the upper three by three of the result. So we've got right, add matrices, normalize that. Why would we want to do that? Well, maybe we have an airplane, and <coughs> the upper three by three is the x, y, <coughs> axes describing its orientation, and the last one is its position in the world or the game or whatever you do. And then why does it need to be fast? Well, Cool. Well, first of all, if adding matrices together, that's not really, that's not responsible steering. Um, but you can use it to do steering your vehicle with no trick. In fact, a whole bunch of our video games, like Lucasfilm, the early 3D games, shipped using this crazy trick because trick was too expensive and too slow. You could have TIE fighters coming at you from all directions at a good rate. So we would do stuff like this, where we just add something in and then normalize it. Um, so, and then you might want to indicate it fast because you have a lot of So in this case, what I do, professionally as well, is just run the program, and then randomly stop the debugger in the assembler, and look. And then when I look at this, I say, well, there's my navigator call, and I stopped right there. Like, we're in the hot spot of this code. So, and usually, professionally, this is someone else's code. That I've never seen, and I have not yet looked at the source. I just stopped at the assembly. And if you stop 50 times, plenty of those are going to be in the problem area. Right? So now I have a little loop here, and I thank you. So there's, that's not that much assembly for, for doing this. But it's a problem. That plus is a plus operator, because I wrote this up in C. Plus plus. And so there's going to be more assembly code in that. Right? All of these operators, all these function calls are going to be more assembly. That plus operator should have been inlined by the compiler. It's on 
optimize to compile, didn't. Right? And the only way you know is to look. You don't actually look at the assembly, no idea. And then there's this destructor, which does nothing. Right? I made that. I was like, yes, destructor for a vector. It means to do nothing. This is the assembly point. Right? So I, all that time, the computer is burning electricity and time, and I don't care what it's doing. So there's the assembly that's actually run by this little big function. Right? So we'd like to speed that up. And I've got some ideas, and what I hope is that each crazy idea <coughs> doubles the speed. So if it does that, we'll call it success. So, first one, look at this. Oops. Plus operator on my matrix. I change it to a plus equals. And then here, instead of this equals this normalized, I just think this dot normalized. Anyone have any idea why? <coughs> or what that would possibly change to? So the plus operator has to make a temporary. Right? It makes a temporary matrix, adds two matrices into it, and then copies that over here. And that's going to take time. I don't know how much, but that's going to take extra time to do all of this <coughs> math. And then this is the same thing. It's going to do this stuff, normalize a bunch of things, and then put it in some temporary and then assign it. So, then, so this is my entire code change. And the assembly, I look at the old version, and then the new version. So that's way more efficient, and I can still see everything. Everything is everything I need is in here. Here's four ads, in some kind of loop. It's my ads for matrix, and here's the square root and the divide. So that's got to be normalized. So it's doing the right thing. And it's ten times faster. So I can throw a party, or if it's professional, I can send a bill. <laughs> and uh, and they can throw a party. Um, but there's more stuff I'd like to do. I'm going to kind of breeze through those just in the interest of time. Um, the, so, Cindy, you probably come in contact with at some point. Everybody's phones and laptops and everything have these 128 bit floating point registers that can do things. You can stamp it out, uh, single instruction, multiple data. So, you can do it in parallel. Um, that have had that for years. It used to be this expensive computer had it. Now everything has it. And uh, but my compiler only used these guys. If I look at the instructions, I'll see a bunch of add S tests, which is add single uh, with single precision. And so the, all of the rest of this stuff is cold and dark all day long on everybody's laptops and everybody's computers basically all day. In fact, on Blue Crystal as well. Right? Those parts of the local pipe tend to be more. Um, so I won't go through the code, I'm not changing that, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and it, 2x speed up. So that's, not, that's not a 4x speed up, but still pretty good. Um, again, for not much work. And then now we get into the part where I can make the code a little bit ugly. <laughs> By looking at the assembly, I can see that there's stuff that should be in register, but it's being kicked out to memory and brought back in register. So I played with the order in which things are done. These two shouldn't do anything different from each other, but they assemble differently on this compiler. They do look very well. I made the code uglier, which is not my favorite thing to do, but it's got another 2x speed. So now we're talking, now we're getting in the really, really fast for what this is doing. And then the last thing, the last kind of silly idea to try is here's our normalized, which now we've vectorized. So these are all vectors, and then it just does all this in parallel. There's a square root <coughs> and a divide. Right. All CPUs, all main ones anyway, have a reciprocal square root instruction that's about triple speed. So you can do a reciprocal square root of four numbers at the same time, right? And then I don't even have to divide, which is slow. I can multiply by my reciprocal. It's not the same precision. So you can use it in all cases. But if I'm steering TIE fighters, they're going to die anyway. Um, so by doing that, by adding the R and changing the slashes to stars, 
All right, well, it didn't double the speed, but it's not bad. So now we're 50x where we were, and we haven't even really done very much work. Certainly no engineering. Um, so, why? I mean, it's interesting to go through and do this as an exercise, but every software developer, everywhere in the world, has a staff, programmers slash engineers, who are doing one of three things, and they're not doing all three. You're implementing new stuff, optimizing, speeding up, or you're debugging. You get to put the dot anywhere you want, anytime you touch the keyboard, right? If you are implementing new stuff in a program that already exists, you're going to be making it less optimal and more buggy. It's just, I mean, you can move this dot kind of down here and be careful with the bugs, and you know, you can play, you can play with that, but really you just got one dot, right? And if you're optimizing, you're going to be adding bugs and reducing features, maybe, and if you're debugging, you got it. <clears throat> so here's a programming team, right? People get assigned to stuff. They go, okay, I'll fix this. Okay, well, this is too slow. I'll make it faster. <clears throat> and uh, at the beginning of a project, everybody on the team had better be up here, otherwise there's not going to be a product to sign. Right? So that's your, your kind of, uh, at that point, <clears throat> even, if, even if you have a bug reporting system set up at this point, it's just going to be filled out with bugs, because your testers are going to be fighting together, and none of these people are going to fix it. <clears throat> at the end of the project, everybody's all down to give up. There is no part in the project where everybody is required to all be in the optimized corner. So I started a company a few years ago, and I just hang out there, right? I, I join a team, I don't know how your stuff works, but they've all done a great job. It's not that they did a crap job making the software. They've done a great job. And I start profiling, start optimizing, and then as soon as stuff starts going faster, these guys all and gals all get happy. And, uh, and I'm an uncoachable resource, so I just sit and optimize it. So, with very few exceptions, I don't implement any features or uh, I'll debug you know, the stuff that I wrote, of course. But uh, I'm not critical path on anything. I just make it faster, make it faster. That means I can work on several projects at once, and it means that my games are easily made. Right? So I can say, I can come back and say, look, it's 54 times faster. And they say, that's awesome. Keep doing stuff. Um, so, right. so uh, that has allowed me to be on project teams that are fascinating that I would not have even been qualified to work on, including some of the stuff I'm doing in Bristol. I'm doing this optimization and some implementation. And the only way I can help the quantum researchers with their stuff is by understanding the research top to bottom by the time I'm done. And I love that. It's like a whole semester every single day of that. Um, so this is uh, it's a gateway that very few people use to be able to become a part of a project, but it's something you can practice on your own. I used to practice on Photoshop colors. Right? I don't have the source code to them, but if you don't mind reading assembly, Everything's open source. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in fact, one of my main customers for optimization, I got because I was working for a different company and found this speed bottle and was not an error code. It was the software that they had bought. So I uh, did a binary patch in that software and then sent it to the, the provider of the software. And they got back to us the same day and said, don't use the binary patch because it freaks me out. Um, here's uh, the real fix the same day. Right? And so we got triple speed for our software from a medium-sized company instantly. And then later on, I started working directly with it. <coughs> All right. So I told you there would be more crazy part. And with my... Ah, there we go. Okay. Uh, so, 3D, 3D accelerated hardware is a great example of new tech arrives, see what it can do, and then shenanigans and see. Um, here's a more new one, right? Anybody know what that is? So I have one here. Uh, that one. 
It's a Pico projector. And it's just a little bitty projector. In fact, this one's big. I have another one that's half the size on each dimension. It's just not a power one. Um, so Pico projectors, they're not that new. They're you know, more than 10 years old now, but they are really been applied well. And so I was, I was trying to figure out what craziness could you get up to with one of these? So I bought some. All right, so there it is. It's basically a little bitty deal. And then I, then I squished them all together in an array and thought, okay, this is, and I couldn't afford um, 12 of them, so I put a mirror there so that they you can kind of get the full of that. And, um, and then, and, uh, so then I thought if you, if each projector paints, each person's face it can see with a different color, then you can have a dot matrix sign, like one of these kind of buses, and you can see it in your language, and this person can see it in their language. Right? Or it can tell you one thing and then another thing, and you can get angry at each other. Um, so this is like a personal display. You could have a, you could just stand here and everybody could read a different message on the display. That would be super fun and kind of crazy. Um, and uh, there are, you can probably think of a few issues with it. First of all, you need a lot of dots, and but right now these are a few hundred pounds each. Um, and then uh, also, they get really thermal. Right? Those guys all push together. I have a little fan right here. Yeah, there's my fan. <laughs> right, and it's very, uh, so it, it's not as early. Like when you're talking to your circuits and you have a whole array of them, then you can maybe do some crazy stuff. So the application that I actually love from this came from a totally different direction. <clears throat> Another, I don't have any kids of my own, right? But I keep collecting these guys. <laughs> <clears throat> so this is Miles. He was in leukemia treatment from one time he was two. <clears throat> this is him at five. And his wish for Megan, which this guy's only the one. Um, <clears throat> It was not to get Batman's autograph. It was to get his job. Right? He wanted to learn the acrobatics, the crime fighting, the fencing, the whole shebang, and be Batman. And uh, so, so make a wish policy. And they said, this, this little guy, he's had a really rough. I'm going to teach him to be Batman. Like, yes. <laughs> yes. I don't have time. And let's do it. Um, and so, uh, so, in fact, if I had my own, because I might not have time. Um, so, the thing is, is in the plan, what we're going to do is going to be a, an event like this size. Um, it turned out it, it grew into a crazy big fun thing. But we were going to have the, uh, the police chief, the real one in San Francisco, sending encouraging messages and telling the bank to be robbed and he's this and you know, do the Batman uh, kind of. Uh, and then I was going to show it to them on a phone or, or an iPad or something, but just, you've seen the suit, there's nowhere to put an iPad. Um, and if the moment I pull out a phone, I'm just a grown up on a phone, right? There's no awesome, there's no Batman. Right? So, so the thought was, I take the, something like this and then strap it to my arm and shoot the chief's message out onto a car or onto the ceiling or whatever. And um, so, so there's the, the, the little ones, as I mentioned, are just not powerful enough to do it. So luckily, TI had sent me this for some other random thing. I think I, I broke some of their other ones, and they wanted the failures back. So they sent me one of these as a thank you. Um, and so get this together. Maybe I'll strap it to my arm uh, using an exercise case, and then test it in daylight. And it works a little bit, but it's um, like, like the other ones, it's, it gets pretty thermal. Like it's, but our hairs grow back. So, <laughs> get it, the chief's message, he records some, some, some really awesome stuff. I would cast him as a police chief in actual um, And he was a great sir, as a police chief. And uh, so then, get this stuff, and then this thing, here's where the, the CS comes in. This is a Linux machine by a company called Gumsticks. In fact, this little piece here, this little rectangle, is the actual computer. It has a half gig of RAM and half gig of storage. Uh, and this is a micro SD slot, so it's really little. Um, and then the rest of this is just interface board. Uh, 
and I, I have a rule of what I'm doing. Again, this isn't engineering, right? This is just staying up late. So I have a rule of never solder directly to the board. So I totally did solder this stuff to the board. And, um, and I broke this two days before the event. Um, I did a stupid rookie error. Um, any Linux users here? Okay. I, I was I had it, the video program wasn't quite done, but I knew I needed to make it launch a startup, and so I set a little launch a startup thing, which is harder than you think. And I didn't put an ampersand at the end of my launch command, so it started my incomplete video play program at startup with no way to exit, and so it didn't work, and I couldn't exit. And with this little machine, there was no control all the way. Put a keyboard, but there was, I tried a million things, there was nothing. So I emailed the company who makes these and told them what I was up to. And the CEO of the company called me the next day and said, That's so cool! I'm sending you one by courier right now. So they <laughs> sent me another one, I tapped it in place, and good order. Um, so then, and then I later had a little, uh, right, back to the laser cutter to make a case so that I don't break it. And then, I, so the whole thing takes a lot of power, but it's got belt, right? And so that's a perfect place to store batteries. And then, uh, and then I bought a speaker from Radio Jack. And so I have a pile of stuff that works, uh, and it's got very recently the moment we step out the door. And so go back to Laser Cutter and make some pieces and try out different stuff. And then they went, kind of looks cool. And then test it. <coughs> and the night before, test it. And then jump into a custom line of being a five year old and take over the city. And rescue a cute mechanical engineer, my wife, who <laughs> did not need rescue. In fact, before we got there, she was driving a truck with maps and trampolines so that we could have awesome rescuing her. Um, and, uh, and, and so then they, they had asked for 100 volunteers to make it feel like it was actually doing something, and they accidentally got 20,000. So <laughs> we had a massive police escort, um, and it was, uh, it was ridiculous and super fun. And the police officers who were working that shift were happy because they got to be like firemen for a day, because everyone was happy to see them, and they all got to be back. So. <laughs> so, and then, so this mayor, this mayor of the week is giving Miles to the EOC, Miles to Ted. At this point, Miles can do the whole thing without me, no problem. Um, he's, uh, he's got it. Uh, and we actually, every every single place we pulled up in the car, I would open the door and say, kind of see how it's doing, and, uh, and say, who are you? And he said, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, however, check this out. Oh, uh, it's still broken. The cases, there are pieces of the case at the ballpark and in the bank. Um, most of it broke fighting the penguin. This is my, this is my USB power thing. It's gone. This whole thing is completely non-functional. It's since been repaired, and then I broke it again, walking on my hands at an elementary school. Um, so, uh, but it worked. It did the job, and it was a super funny experience. So, actually, close off time. I'm going to have to rip through some of this, but uh, I can do that. So the reason I'm here in Bristol is that about eight years ago, I snuck out of work at Lucasfilm to go to a talk by a guy who was visiting from someplace called Bristol. I had, he was in the UK, but I didn't know where it was. And uh, I've been doing independent research, right, technology, in quantum computation, just just in theory, right? And the cool things are, you know, I'm going to rip through some of this, you have equivalents to digital logic, right? But it can operate on every possible value of box. So, oh, and you can do some crazy things like, you can do a square root of not being. So it's a game where you apply it twice and you get a not operation, which you can't do with digital logic. Does anyone, does anyone have, to have any one computation yet? So, okay, a little bit. All right, it's super fun. It's the biggest logic puzzle ever. And so I have a, I have a simulator that's online that you can actually use for free anytime you want to build stuff. So there's a lot of stuff that you can kind of assemble. In fact, there's 
really appreciate this. This multiply a by two. I'm just bitching. Right? I'm not actually doing anything positive. Um, so, and then you've probably heard of Schwartz factoring algorithm, which just does the same stuff I just showed you. And then a little QFT, which is a quantum Fourier transform, which is kind of the magic in this assembly. And this gives you an exponential speed up in code breaking. Right? That's cool. That will be that will be fun and useful. It's really hard to implement. Um, Anthony Lang from SQI is world famous for being the first person to use quantum computation hardware to factor the number twenty one. Right. He got seven three, and um, and uh, that was done here. So ten qubits to a quantum computer is instead of being a number from zero to ten twenty three. It's 1,024 complex numbers. Tiny. There's a little caveat after it. But you can pretty much do what you want to manipulate this pattern of complex numbers. So this is the output of a computation that I've done, where you see these periodic ripples here. I use an inverse quantum Fourier transform to get the period here, and that gives me a result I couldn't have gotten efficiently any other way. And so there's all of this, but, but when you, but this is the state inside these 10 qubits that links the 10 qubits to each other. To read it, it's like inspecting a snowflake with a really strong laser, right? The moment you read this, boom, you get one number between 0 and 1023, just like if you were on a classroom. But there's all sorts of stuff you can do, so it's really fun. And these folks are, uh, are, are right up the, right up the road, and they're, the thing that struck me at the talk that I got to, oh, there's a more recent picture too. Uh, uh, but this, I like this one too because see this guy who's photoshopping here. <laughs> <laughs> That's Jeremy O'Brien. He's one of the founders of you. He's not Photoshop. That's not Photoshop. It's a cardboard cutout. It's full size and it's in the building. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, so, yeah. So the talk that I went to eight years ago was again in Alberto Gruzzo from here who was showing silicon chips that did quantum computation just on a really small scale. And I thought, oh, that's cool. If I ever go to the UK, I'll see if I can get a tour of the lab. So I got a, so I totally did. And, and now I'm doing postdoc here. Um, side note, I haven't got a PhD, but they don't mind that I don't mind because I make stuff faster. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is what we call bulk optics. It's kind of like vacuum tube computers compared to this, which is more like an integrated circuit. And this, which is like a big, pretty glass integrated circuit, it's reprogrammable. Right? And then this, which is a little communications chip. All of this stuff is being designed right in NSQI, right here. And there's been tons of communication about it. And there's some, uh, so this is one of the devices, this is the glass one we were just looking at. That's, that's a reprogrammable optics lab, basically, that can do general quantum computation, just not, not very many bits. Here's uh, cryptography. So I mentioned code breaking. Code, code breaking won't be, uh, won't be really powerful for years. This is ready now. You actually have one of the experiments in a credit card size device that does quantum cryptography. Um, and then, so we have, I'm going to break through some of this, but we basically, something that was invented here uh, is time reversed spontaneous four wave mixing, which is a way that you can generate entangled photons on chip, which is brand new. We used to have to go through a lot more rigor world to get them. And you do it by using this crazy Dr. Seuss spiral on a microchip, and, uh, or a resonator, and then you use a filter to get the two photons. So basically, you have two pump photons coming at the same frequency, and then your entangled pair means at different frequencies, so you can then separate them. So, and then to get photons onto the chip, we literally physically glue fibers onto the top of this waveguide. It's a special thing called grading coupler, and then the photons basically just bounce in with, with very little loss. Um, and then to detect them, we use a single photon detector, and it clicks, or it doesn't click, and that collapses the quantum state, just like the snowflake with blazing. And then to do a not bake, that's not going to use cross the rails, or we relabel the outputs, it doesn't really matter. Um, one kind of fun thing, with digital electronics, you need two layers to do this. With electronics, you don't, they just go. Um, to 
to do implement a phase gate, which is what we use to control the logic, what you have to do is look, you have one photon in two places at once. And there's a little girl in elementary school uh, raised her hand and said, this, this one thing has to be in two places at the same time? How do you explain that? And I said, done. I said, here's the thing. Everything is. She was like, <laughs> so, so you can delay the photon in one path. It's like a what-if path. You can delay the photon if you want, you can make a path longer. But we don't really have that manufacturing tolerance to do that right, and also that would be etched in silicon. So the easiest way to slow down the photon is to change the speed of light, um, which we do using little bitty heaters. Right? We heat up the silicon. Refractive index changes when it slows down the chip, and you get your face. Um, so, and this is and that's what it looks like over here. It's just a piece of metal. All right. And then directional capillaries are how we put the one fluid line in two places at once. It's just like a knee splitter, and I'm going to skip over it. And we have all of this other crazy shenanigans. Uh, there's so much information in NFDY. If you are ever curious about this side of computing, if you feel like maybe you missed the invention of the computer in the 50s, you totally didn't miss it. This is what's happening this week. Um, so there's a direction color. And multiple couple does the same thing, just using push track. And then, so here is, right, human hair, and I think our, our wave guys, these photon wave guys are really small. And there's one of our chips. And if we zoom in, you can see, oh, let me zoom in some more. These guys are the wave guys, the skinny little things. These are the heaters with the electrical paths. The only thing you use electricity for is to run heaters and do the phase changes. This heater's not hooked up to anything, but this photon's going to be in both paths at the same time. It's best if it experiences the same material changes, just kind of keep it once a half. So, uh, and then over here, we have a bunch of, these are our creative couplers, right? That's where you get photons in and out. So these are just little testing of resonator sizes. Um, or higher risk or something. And then this, everything happens at room temperature on chip except the detection. If you're detecting one infrared photon, you've got to be cold. And so this is a cryostat, and it's ugly, and they, this is, this green wire comes from the chip, and then this silver wire has liquid helium going through it, um, and then these wires all go to the computer that counts the uh, Someday this will be on chip, it's the hard part. Uh, and here is why I'm actually here. Here's, here's what's exciting about all of this thing. And it's not faster computation, because we're going to get that anyway, right? We're every year. So, mixing the information world the physical world gets really weird. <coughs> the reason that cryptography exists is that this photon passes through here, it's not a bit. It's a cube. It's a physical option. If you're going to steal secrets from a bank, right, account numbers and whatnot, what you do, don't do this, is um, you tap the line and copy all of the encrypted data and send it to your supercomputer and let it go for three years, four years, and you'll have everybody's account numbers. With this, it's a physical object, so you can't copy it. You can exchange it. You can stuff to it, but if you ever observe it, quantum state squishes, and Alice and Bob can tell you're there. Right? The people, that's the people who are sending the, the, the info. So that physicality is interesting. And there's a guy named Daniel Gottesman who's famous in the quantum world, and last year, this is just last year, right, published a paper showing if you could use an entangled pair, which they need in cryptography anyway. The cryptography folks are getting lots of money to build devices and iterate on them and make them really good. So if you can take one of their entangled pair generators and then get a pair, get, get one photon to each telescope, you could increase the baseline of these telescopes and actually make them work much better, make their resolution higher. But this thing here that they're using, this is our waveguide chips. It's the same thing. So you basically take a photon here, a photon here, and you do computing. This is really simple computing, but if you, as we name more sophisticated devices, this is the input. We can do anything with this, right? 
good. And at that point, you have photons generated and photons from outer space mixing. And so this is a two-slate experiment, right? This, this had physics. This is one photon going in two really cool looking slits, and then and then you look at your hair and Maybe you could do something so ridiculously sophisticated with the light that it would be a completely new type of telescope. It might be impossible, but 3D graphics hardware was pretty unmanageable uh, not very many years ago. And if you did do this, if you had something you could try plugging into a big interferometric telescope, the best place in the world to test it Is that kind of So this thing that we were just looking at, this that we kind of walked past, that's not an optical telescope, that's an interferometer. In fact, that guy and that guy are two units in arguably the best interferometric telescope in the world. And in the middle, the light all comes together, and if you had a photonic device that could do something no one's ever done before, that would be where you look at it. 